Slowly over the course of the year, I've been giving you a brief history, the history of science from the time of the ancient Greeks, all the way until about the middle of the 17th century, culminating, for example, with Galileo's discoveries, but with the use of the telescope and the discovery of Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Here's how we can summarize that entire 2000 year history that is in the following way. Recall that according to the ancient Greeks, everything that they knew about motion is basically summarized into three statements. So we first of all have the idea of the geocentric universe. The earth is the center of the universe, and then all celestial motion that we see is perfectly circular and centered on the earth. That has now been shown to be incorrect with the discovery of Kepler's laws of planetary motion, and those are observationally supported by Galileo's use of the telescope. And then we have motion near the surface of the earth. First of all, heavier objects fall faster than lighter objects. That of course has now been experimentally shown to be incorrect, by Galileo, this then resulted in free fall, the discovery that all objects fall with the same constant acceleration, regardless of their weight in the absence of air resistance. And then we also have, according to the ancient Greeks, all moving objects eventually come to rest. That was also experimentally shown to be incorrect by Galileo, that then culminated with the discovery of the law of inertia. So basically everything about motion, according to the ancient Greeks, has now been shown to be incorrect. That's where we are here now in the middle of the 17th century. Okay, so mid 17th century. Basically everything about motion, according to the ancient Greeks, has been shown to be incorrect. However, at the time, there was nothing to take its place. What was lacking was a unifying principle to tie everything together. For example, Galileo's kinematics of a projectile near the surface of the Earth. Galilean relativity and the discovery of the law of inertia, ultimately supporting, for example, how the Earth can be in motion as it orbits the Sun, yet we don't feel its motion. And then we also have celestial motion. We have planetary motion, for example, as the planets orbit the Sun. We have mathematical descriptions of these different types of motion, but there was, as of yet, no explanation for it. In other words, what was lacking was a unifying principle to tie everything together. So then therefore, it's almost as if the stage is set for the right person to come along at just the right time. That person was Isaac Newton. Now we've been talking about Newton's laws, of course, over the course of this class for the last few weeks, but I really haven't said a word as of yet about what it was that Newton exactly did. Let's now get to Isaac Newton. And we are now specifically in the 1660s. In the mid-1660s, Isaac Newton was your age. He was about 18 years old. He leaves his family farm in the middle of England to go to Cambridge University, which is about 50 miles west of London in southern England. He goes to Cambridge University with the aim of becoming a mathematician. By the time that he finishes his undergraduate degree a couple of years later, not only is he a mathematician, but he's probably the greatest mathematician who has ever lived up until this point in history. However, while he was at the university, there was a horrible outbreak. There was essentially a pandemic. How about that? There was a horrible outbreak of the Black Plague in Southern England. The Black Plague was deadly. It killed 90% of its victims. Most of that outbreak was centered on London. However, instances of the Black Plague started to appear at Cambridge University, once again, which is about 50 miles or so west of London. So then therefore, basically the university closed, much like, for example, that we see today during the COVID-19 pandemic. So Isaac Newton basically flees the university and he goes back to his family farm in England, basically to wait out the pandemic. He's there for 18 months. While he's at his family farm in 18 months, Isaac Newton does the following.
Okay, first of all, he discovers the laws of motion. He intuits the equation F equals MA. As we've already seen, however, in order to mathematically describe motion, differential calculus is necessary. Isaac Newton literally discovers not just differential, but also integral calculus. Now, of course, these first two feats here are quite impressive, but it's the third that's actually perhaps the most important. He discovers what is called the law of universal gravitation, and he uses this physical principle to explain that Galileo's kinematics of a projectile near the Earth's surface and planetary motion as the planets orbit the sun is actually the same thing. He does it. He solves the problem, the problem of motion that I've been describing throughout this class thus far, over a 2,000 year history of period of time, ultimately now culminating with the discovery of the law of universal gravitation. He solves the problem of planetary motion. He solves the problem of motion near the surface of the Earth. He discovers the unifying principle that was lacking. He discovers law of universal gravitation and as we'll see he uses this physical principle to precisely show you'll understand what that means as we get further into this to precisely show the projectile motion and planetary motion. Motion near the surface of the Earth and motion in the heavens, if you will, are the same. As I said, he does it. He solves the problem. He discovers the unifying principle to explain motion that was lacking. unifying principle to explain motion. And he does all of it when he's just a couple of years older than you guys are right now, when he was about 20 or 21 years old. And he did all of this over an 18 month period while waiting out the pandemic, while waiting out the Black Plague. This is largely considered to be the greatest intellectual accomplishment that anybody has ever done throughout history. However, for various reasons, it mostly had to do with his personality. For various reasons, he actually waited quite a while to finally publish his work. He didn't publish his work until he was in his 40s. He publishes his work in 1687. Let me do some erasing here. Newton finally publishes what is called Principia, which is Latin for principles. The title of his book is very simple. He publishes Principia in 1687. The publication of Principia is a watershed event in human history. It's probably the most important book that's ever been written. And I do not say that lightly. Here's how you can get an idea as to why the publication of Principia is so important. We're gonna plot here in a little graph. Okay, on the horizontal axis of the graph, we're gonna have time. Okay, we're gonna have time from the time of the ancient Greeks, I'll call that AG, more than 2,000 years ago, up to 1687 and then beyond. And then on the vertical axis of the graph, let me just briefly describe our sum total knowledge of nature, what we know about the universe. But then, of course, what we know about the universe can be applied. In other words, all of the engineering and technology and so on that comes from that. Let me go ahead and put that on the vertical axis. So here's our knowledge of nature. And then the 
technology and engineering applications that come from that. Now, very slowly over a 2000 year period of history from the time of the ancient Greeks to 1687, our knowledge of the universe and the technology and engineering that came from that knowledge, it slowly increased over time, but it did so linearly, that is like so. However, since the publication of Principia in 1687, the mathematical nature of this graph has changed. It is not linear. It is exponential, like so, exponentially growing curve, exponential growth. So here's how you can get a handle, for example, is in the nature, if you will, of this exponentially growing curve. For example, right now it is estimated that we double our knowledge of nature at this point approximately once every 10 years or so. So then therefore, when it comes to the laws of nature and all the details associated with it, regardless of the complexity of what we're studying, we know basically twice as more today than we did just 10 short years ago in the year 2010. If you go back 20 years, we then know more than four times as much and so on and so on. To give you an idea as to how important this is with respect to my own effectiveness as a teacher, I have to stay current. I graduated from college more than 30 odd years ago. However, because of the exponential nature of this curve, I have to stay current. In other words, I have to stay current with the current discoveries in physics and astronomy, for example, here in the early 21st century, such that I can instruct you as we go forward. So I have to continuously read what is going on in the various fields of the sciences, I do so as a layman, however, in order to be able to apply that knowledge as is necessary to here in my classroom. We also, of course, can see this exponentially growing curve technologically. For example, those of you that are into computers may have heard of something called Moore's Law. Moore, Gordon Moore, was the founder of the Intel computer chip company back in the late 1950s. And when the first electronic computers were starting to be built in the late 1940s and into the 1950s and beyond, Moore noticed a trend. He noticed a trend associated with the speed of computer chip processing power, the memory associated with computers, their ubiquity, in other words, how commonly we see them around us here in the world, and also their cost. What he discovered is that all of those trends are basically doubling approximately once every 18 months, and computers get progressively cheaper and cheaper all the time as a result. So for example, if you buy the most powerful laptop computer that you can buy today on the market, it's basically twice as powerful as the most powerful computer that you can buy just 18 months ago. This is of course very noticeable with smartphone technology. Compare for example, the smartphone that you have available to you right now compared to one say just a couple of years ago. It is a much more powerful device right now. And once again, this exponentially growing curve shows no signs of slowing down. So for those of you that are into technology, it becomes actually very difficult the further and further into the future that we look to begin to understand where the technological trends are going. Ultimately, we may reach a point where the most powerful computers that we're able to build are actually as powerful as the human mind. That is actually estimated to occur easily within your lifetimes, perhaps by the year 2040 or so. By the time that we get to that point with the most powerful computers that can mimic the human mind, we start to run up against understanding exactly what may happen in the future from that point forward. For those of you that are into this idea, you may be familiar with something called the technological singularity that is used to describe perhaps this moment in time. These trends of technology accelerating in this manner are usually not very noticeable over the course of just a couple of months, but definitely over the course of a couple of years, they become very noticeable, especially if you're paying close attention. All of it, every bit of it, basically rests right here on the publication of Principia in 1687. Our entire technological civilization can basically be traced back to this moment in time in human history. Basically, the publication of Principia represents the birth of modern science as we know it today, and because of that birth, our knowledge of nature and the technology that comes from it has been exponentially growing since that point. Okay, let me conclude right here as part one of this lecture. I'll now continue in just a few minutes with part two.